you have your Bibles with you, would you open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 5? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I know you missed it. It's just been one week that we didn't do 2 Corinthians, and you've been craving it. You've been feeling incomplete in the last week, and this explains it. You were just, what's going to happen next? What will Paul do next? When will the sentence end? <laughs> it's not till chapter 10. That's when it's going to end. It's chapter 10. Second Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to continue on in our, our uh, study in Second Corinthians. And uh, I'll be reading a couple of verses that we did cover last time. But again, because of the way that Paul writes, you know, one idea is connected to the next idea is connected to the next idea. And so we're trying to weave a tapestry together here, and uh, you need to overlap some of the threads of thought, some of the concepts and the topics together in order to, I think, get a more accurate picture of what Paul is trying to say. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read verses 8 through 13. I'll have you know that I read verses 8 through 21 last service and then realized, yeah, that's not happening. So... I've got next week's teaching, good to go, ready, prepared, <laughs> locked in the barrel. But uh, we won't get to all of it today, and that's, that's totally fine. Um, I'll be reading from verses 8 through, through 13, so starting in verse 8, here we go. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, also we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must appear, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God. And I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but we are giving you an occasion to be proud of us, that you may have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are of sound mind, it is for you. What we covered last time, a couple of weeks ago here in 2 Corinthians, is the idea that our eternal home is not this earth. It's, it's not this life. That God has uh, made us for an eternal dwelling that is in heaven with him. That's where we are meant to be. And a, a company with that idea is also the idea that we have an eternal or a weighty purpose in our lives. That it's not just a matter of trying to not sin ugh, until you die and then you get to be in heaven with God. That's not like the sum total of your purpose in God. But accessing the purpose that God has laid out for you begins with having a perspective and an attitude that is connected to eternity. That you yourself have an eternal perspective and you cast your mind and you set it there on eternal things, on heavenly things, on spiritual things. And Paul has been going through uh, th this whole letter trying to explain these kinds of things, these are really spiritual things. And these kinds of things over here, they're not really spiritual. They're more natural things. And so he's been comparing and contrasting what are eternal things or spiritual things and what are temporal things and are, are natural things. And so the, the first two verses that I read here is, is, is referencing that. He's saying, look, I want to be home, that is, in heaven, because I know that that's where I belong, God. It's, it's with you. I want to be there. But even if I am absent from home, but present in the body, um, that he wants to be pleasing to the Lord. So there's something about having an eternal perspective that begins to kind of like cultivate a genuine desire to just want to be pleasing to God. And that that becomes, I mean, the word that Paul uses here is ambition. I really like that word, actually. I, I, I feel like I'm a pretty ambitious person. Um, and it's not a, a dirty word. I think that some people are like, ambition, you shouldn't be ambitious. Well, no, that's, that's not true. Now, selfish ambition, 
it's hyphenated, so okay, yeah, it's a, it's a word, but that is something that the Bible talks about. So ambition that seeks to add to myself, that is all about me and contributing towards my own life or my own comfort or, or what have you. Uh, but rather, ambition is kind of like having a very specific and strong goal. So the overall goal of my life, the purpose of my life, is pretty simple. I just want to be pleasing to God. That's why I love that worship song that we sang earlier, uh, I Love You, Lord. Um, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ears. I just love that song. There's, there's something so pure about that. And I love singing that, uh, that, that song and even singing that last little bit, that refrain over and over and over again because it captures what's really going on in my heart that really at the end of the day, all that I want to do is I just want to be pleasing to God wherever I am, whether here in heaven, here, there, whatever. I just want to be pleasing to you, Lord. So it starts there. He wants to be pleasing to the Lord. And then there's verse 10, which had always kind of confused me a little bit because it just felt a little disjointed. Like it was kind of thrown in there and like, what is, I don't really understand what that has to do with the rest of what Paul is talking about. So I'm going to read it specifically and explain why I was confused by it. Hopefully I don't like, you know, add some confusion to you that wasn't there or something, but I, I hope to explain it. Verse number 10, he says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. When I read that verse in isolation, the first thing that I think of is like, okay, I'm going to be, I'm going to go before the judgment seat of Christ, and then all of the nasty thoughts that I've ever thought are going to be weighed against all of the times that I helped an old lady across the street or something like that, and then, you know, we're going to see kind of like where it measures up, and then, you know, whatever the scale says, I'm going to receive the recompense of those things in, 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 in my person when I'm in heaven. So I didn't really understand that. Like, I don't really get that. What's going on here? Well, the context, though, of what Paul is talking about is not like personal morality. He, he, he isn't going through a list of things and saying, hey, guys, you're blowing it in the following 17 areas. Number one, this, 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 and this. Oh, and by the way, you're going to have to sit before the judgment seat of Christ, and you're going to have to, you know, have recompense for all these things that you're doing that's bad. That's not the context of this at all. The context of this verse is Paul introducing the idea that we are meant to live our lives for the sake of other people. That's the context. So I think rather, maybe not rather, probably in addition to, yeah, okay, there are eternal consequences for, for, for things that I choose, but above and beyond that, for the things that I choose in relation to other people, what I do matters. There is a weighty ramification for the choices that I make in my life that affect the people around me. Even above and beyond the thoughts in my mind or things that I do that maybe don't involve other people, but how I live my life has weighty consequence to them. I think that there's this like tension that we as believers have to live in. It's a common issue or temptation on, on one side and the other side. On the one side, I find that people genuinely have a hard time believing that their life matters that much. They don't really believe that what they do matters. I don't know. I don't think it matters that much. Whether or not I show up at church, whether or not I'm present with my kids, whether or not I'm all there when I'm at work with my coworkers, it, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter if I read my Bible. It doesn't really matter if I do. It doesn't really matter because I don't see anything in front of me anyway. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, as the Bible says, not thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to think. <laughs> thinking that you matter so much that, you know, God is kind of lost in the, in the weeds a little bit because of the glory of your life and how impressive you are. But there's this sweet middle spot where we don't think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think but we have a healthy acceptance of the fact that even though I have an earthly vessel that's not that impressive, God, you know, the king of the universe, the one that like, you know, created everything, he has placed inside of you a treasure. And you understand you have a treasure inside of you. You understand it didn't come from you, so that's not the argument there. But you realize I've been given a treasure 
And whether you decide to use that treasure or not, I think is what Paul's talking about here. There's eternal consequences for the ways that you live your life. And Paul is trying to retool the way that these people work, the way that they, the way that they think. Because sometimes when people are struggling with, I don't think what I do matters, it's because they don't know what kind of fruit to look for. Or they're, they're just thinking, well, I'm not that impressive. I'm not like that big preacher person over there. I don't know how to have compassion like that. So pff, uh, little old me, I, I guess I can't do anything. Not realizing that you are squandering and dishonoring the treasure that God has put inside of you it has the same origin point as the treasure that's in that person over there. So I think Paul is saying, like, guys, we're not just, like, playing around here. This is really serious stuff. What you do matters. How you are matters. The decisions you make matter. Verse 11, he says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord. Why the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord because he's recognizing, God, you have the authority and you have the power and you have used those two things to place inside of me a treasure. He's not talking about a fear of the Lord like he's afraid like, oh no, what's going to happen to me? The whip's going to crack down even harder because I gossiped again. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about, I recognize that in your authority, God, you have chosen to do this in me. And I want to be a good steward of what you've given me. He says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men but we are made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. So he says, knowing the fear of the Lord, it's, it's very nicely linear. He says, look, I want to be pleasing to God with everything that I have. I recognize that God has given me something that I have to give, and I recognize his authority has been used to give me that. Therefore, that's why I am so driven to try to persuade men, to persuade people to reconcile them with the Father, he says later on in this chapter. That's what he ends up doing. So he starts with, God, I want to be pleasing to you. And do you see where he ends up? He ends up with his life oriented towards other people to try to help them in the kingdom of God. There's something that's like, I, got, I don't know, I'm going to give it to you a little raw, okay? So if I use like a weird phrase or something that's not, not helpful for you, then just, just ditch it. But it's almost like if you live your life just trying not to sin, even that is too selfish for how God has made you to be, actually. It's just, it's too focused on yourself. I know it sounds really noble. I, I, mean, I mean, you know, and, and all of us don't want to sin. I mean, like, come on. Yeah, we don't want to do wrong things. Of course not. But if that's the only thing that you're doing, it's still too focused on yourself. That's not actually how you were designed. That is not the contour of the puzzle piece of your life. And if you only have that perspective, and that's, that's your big ambition to not do bad things, when you try to slot into the plans and purposes that God has for you, it, it won't fit right. It, like, it won't work. You try to put it in there. You know, like my daughters, they're, they're almost four. My two oldest daughters are almost four. And, you know, like little kid puzzles, the puzzle pieces are like this big, you know, and you're like, you know, it's pretty kind of easy to put it in. But man, whew, insight into humanity. I'm a much better, better puzzle maker than my four-year-old daughters. Sometimes they question that, though. And they take that puzzle piece, and they're just like, no, it goes here. I know it goes here. And I'm like, I don't think it goes there, honey. I think it goes over here, because, see, I'm trying to explain it to them. And they just, they're not having it. They're like, mm-mm, it goes here. This is how, it goes here. And when, when I experience that with my children, I often think, oh, dear God. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Where, where, where am I dictating to, like, the creator of the universe? Uh-uh, God, this is how it works. I go here. This is how it works. And he's like, heaven, this, no, it's not really, can I, this is how it works over here. I'm like, uh-uh, I'm going to make it work. But see, that's why your thinking needs to be changed because we've been grown up in a broken world. So our thinking, our intuition, it's all off. It's all broken. And so the things that you think will work, it won't work. There's a psalm that puts it another way, or maybe a proverb. There's a Bible verse that puts it another way. <laughs> it says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in its end, it's the way of death. 
It doesn't mince words there. It's like, that seems really great. And God's like, actually, that'll kill you. Oh, <laughs> like that's the stakes that we're talking about here. That's the truth of what the Bible teaches us. What could you just imagine for a second? What the enemy of your soul wants to convince you of. If the truth is the stakes are life and death, if the truth is what you do really matters, what do you think he's going to try to convince you of? It's not that big of a deal, and it doesn't really matter. But you see, Paul is like, look, you guys are so backwards, but let me, let me teach you these things. When you serve other people, when you die to yourself, when you get down really low, that's when things get really big in the kingdom of God. And the people at, at Corinth, the Corinthians, they were so struggling with being able to recognize what was truly spiritual because they were being kind of tricked by these, these fake or, or pseudo-apostles who looked really impressive. And they're like, well, I guess that's what being spiritual really looks like. And then they look at their own life and be like, well, my life doesn't really look like that. So number one, I don't really think that what I can do is that big of a deal. And number two, I'm going to try to work on looking really impressive. But you see, the whole thing was a ruse. It was a complete, it was just all trickery because it, 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 they basically were ignoring the actual weighty things of the kingdom because they were pursuing things that would lead toward them looking like the really impressive spiritual person when in fact God just kind of wanted them to do something really simple. But that was, you know, would force them to, to die to themselves a little bit. You trying with me here? Okay. So he says... He says, we persuade men. My life is all about trying to convince people that, that God loves them and that he wants to be reconciled with them. And then he uses kind of a funny phrase here. He says, he says but we are made manifest to God, which even the English is like, what does that mean? Uh, what? Like a shipping manifest? What, what does that mean? Manifest, manifestation, it, it kind of just means like apparent. Something became really apparent to you. To borrow my Christmas Eve analogy, if you're looking for the salsa in the fridge and you can't find it, and then your spouse says, it's behind the milk, and you put the mind, ah, oh, the salsa has been made manifest to you in that moment, okay? It, it, I don't know. It, because the language is so like, thou art thine, thy, 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 it's like very uh, religious sounding. I sort of imagine like made manifest, like, you know, like clouds or something, like manifestation. It just means like you can see it, like it's, it's apparent to you. So, he, he's not saying God can't see you unless you do good things, and then you are made manifest to him, you are made apparent to him. That's not really what it's saying. It's, it's, more, like, it's more like God is, he, he has like a song for your life to play. And when you start living your life for the sake of other people, you begin to, it's like the, the instrument of your heart is tuned to the right melody that God wants your life to play. But if you're not living your life for the sake of other people, it's like strumming a guitar when one string is out of tune. In fact, I did that first service. I had Colin come up and like detune a string and then play it. Everyone was like, ah. That's kind of what it is to the Lord. It's like, ah, it's not quite, that's not quite it. And so the Lord will tune your life by changing your perspective, changing the way that you live to get all the strings of your life in alignment so that you can begin to play the song that you were supposed to play. But again, there's this, it's so crucial. I know, I know I'm repeating myself. I know I'm belaboring the point. But it bears repetition. Because when I evaluate my life and I think about, am I really living for the sake of other people in every aspect of my life? The honest answer is no, I'm not. So I, I want to take a fresh look at where am I not living for the sake of other people? But if you don't have that element in your life, do you know what's going to happen? you're probably going to conclude this doesn't work. This doesn't work. Everything's all discordant. Everything's all a mess. You know, like what Colin was saying earlier about like your life just kind of being a mess. Well, let the king come in and tune your life so that the melody you can play is synchronous with what God has designed, has made you, designed you to do. You track with me? You track with what I'm saying? So that's what he means when he said we're made manifest to God. It's like synchronization of our lives with God. And then he says, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. So you probably picked up over the course of reading through these, these few chapters that there's a little bit of tension between Paul and the people at Corinth. 
Remember, he started this church. He's discipled them. He's loved on them. He's, he's introduced them to Jesus. I mean, there's been a lot of significant things that have happened, transpired between Paul and these people. But because they've been pursuing this false spirituality, which is really just the natural man, the natural way of thinking, um, there, had, there had been a wedge that had, had come between Paul and these people. And so that's why he says, I hope that these things I'm explaining to you, the way that I'm living my life, is also synchronous with you. But he, he's not saying, look, I'm going to change everything about my life to be synchronous with you. What he's suggesting is, guys, you are out of sync with God. You are out of sync with the plans and purposes that God has for your life. Now, the good news is, God is a master musician, and no matter how out of tune you are, he can tune you back. It's really no problem. He does it all the time. But just the recognition that there's something fundamental about the offness and the out-of-tune state of being of my life. And Paul is introducing the idea that it's just the people at Corinth, it's too much about them. It's not enough about, about other people. It's not that spiritual when you're so focused on yourself, when you're so impressed with yourself, when you're always endeavoring to have other people be really impressed with you. It's not spiritual. It's just not. It's not that impressive at all. Okay. You okay? <laughs> Let me put the sword away. <laughs> okay. Verse number 12. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us they may, you may have an answer for those who take pride in appearance, but not in heart. Sorry. <laughs> that last part was on a different page. I just, my brain just stopped. Just, okay. So, all right, what's, what's happening here? Again, we're getting some insight. Look, we're going to play the, the role of, of a spiritual Sherlock Holmes, okay? So he's saying, we're not commending ourselves to you again, but we're trying to give you an answer so that when these people come to you and say, what's happening with Paul is not that impressive, it's not really worth your time to really pay attention to that stuff, I'm explaining these things to you so you can actually have an answer to those people or that spirit that would want to rise up in you and say, oh, 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 I want to pursue these things because that's really impressive and prominent and important and that's the kind of ambition that I want to have. Paul is giving them some ammunition so that they can come against that thinking. And whether, you know, that thinking came from another person, it's, it's not about having ammunition against a person, but it's really about the lofty thoughts that would want to contribute towards the kingdom of self instead of the kingdom of God. And so Paul is explaining these things in painstaking detail because he wants to enable them to be able to withstand when there's that temptation to do something different. So... But he is making reference to the fact that these pseudo-apostles commend themselves to the people at Corinth a ton. Look at my resume. This is why you should listen to me. This is why I'm amazing for the following 17 reasons. And, and the people at Corinth were, were falling for it. So he's like, I'm not slipping into that sort of prideful stuff, but I am saying this stuff to you for a reason so that you can know. And he says that you may have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. There was so much emphasis on the way that things looked that it ended up missing the heart. And, and frankly, I think those two things are often diametrically opposed to one another. That when you emphasize appearance, you end up killing the heart. When you go after the heart, sometimes you have to sacrifice how things might appear to people because you are going after the heart of the matter. You're going after what is truly spiritual. It's a risky business being a spiritual person because it just, it won't look that impressive to people with a natural mind. But, but vice versa also works. That being very natural is not that impressive to somebody who is, who is truly spiritual. This is quite frustrating for people who want recognition because of how incredible they are. Oh, I want you to know I led that Bible study for three years. Ooh, three whole years, huh? When you're commending yourself, it doesn't do anything. In fact, the Bible says, well, we're going to read this later on, but the way to commend yourself is not how you think, and it's not how the world thinks either. For the world, it's like you want to listen to an expert, and that makes sense. I'm not trying to, like, you know, to deride that or something. Like, if your computer's broken, you don't go ask a farmer to, you know, fix your computer because... 
I mean, unless it's like a computer farmer or something, I don't know. But like, you know, I don't know. You probably don't, you know, know as much about computers, and so you want to go to the, the expert, right? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having a resume and 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 building a career. But the point is that the way that you do that in the kingdom of God, the way that you build a resume is totally different than the way that you build a commendable resume in the kingdom. And the things that are actually attractive to a genuine spiritual person. Um, are not the things that you might imagine. It's not because, like, I spoke at this conference or I brought this many people to the Lord. Hallelujah for all of those things, and I'm not dishonoring them. But the point is there's a lot more going on behind the scenes, and it's a lot more accessible and approachable for normal people. Take pride in the heart of things, folks, not the appearance. Verse 13. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are of sound mind, it is for you. <laughs> this is awesome. So another accusation that I believe, I mean, this is my reading of the scriptures. This is my opinion, but I, I, I feel pretty safe in giving you this opinion. But I think that, that what the pseudo-apostles, what these fake apostles were saying about Paul to the people at Corinth, behind his back, of course, by the way, um, is... The stuff that Paul is talking about, it's just crazy. It just doesn't even make any sense. Like, why would you do those things? It doesn't make any sense. Here, let me tell you what you need to do. And, and Paul's like, okay, if I appear crazy to you, let me explain to you why. It's because of God. God asks us to do things that we wouldn't normally do, but we do them because he asked us to do them. That is... Such a great description of living a life by faith and not by flesh. You live your life for God, he's going to ask you to do things that make you real nervous. It just is. Sorry, guys. It might not be that thing that you think, you know, everybody gets a little superstitious, which I don't recommend, by the way. Don't give yourself to superstition. There's more going on there than you think. The Bible says the power of the tongue has an intense power for turning the ship of your life. So when you say like, oh, I don't want to go to Africa to be a missionary there, that's probably what God is going to ask me to do, huh? <laughs> that's a superstition. Don't do it. Don't do it. However, recognize that God will ask you to do things that are nerve-wracking. But what part of you, friend, is nervous? I would propose to you it's not your spirit. It's probably your flesh. Might be your pride. Might be... I don't know, all manner of things. But it, and, it, and also, it doesn't have to be like this huge thing, but something really simple, like noticing a coworker who is more down than they usually are and being willing to talk to them and say, hey, is everything okay? You might just left your own devices, never talk to a human being ever. That might be like kind of your, your natural, just like this is where I like to live. I don't like to talk to people. I mean, talking to people I don't know is like my nightmare. But God might ask you to do that, and in faith, believing that God can do something through you, you might talk to somebody you don't know and ask if they're okay, and, oh my gosh, you might even ask, can I pray for you? That's what I'm talking about, living a life of faith. It's like crazy. Why would you do that? Why would you give 10% of your income away? Why would you do that? That makes no sense. But when you live your life spiritually, you're going to do things that don't make any sense except when you use the scriptures. So that leads me to the second part of this verse. So he's like, if we look like we're crazy, Paul, it's, it's almost like he's admitting like, I know it looks crazy. I know. Dying to yourself, who wants to do that, right? It's crazy. But we do it anyway because we believe in the power of it and it's what God has asked us to do. Possessing the fear of the Lord, we say yes. It's like, we look crazy, I get it, but it's for God. The second part, he says, if we are of sound mind, it is for you. I've been trying to communicate. I'm not, I don't know how effectively I've been doing it, which is kind of ironic given the topic, but God does not want to remain mysterious. <laughs> I hope that my explanation of that also is not mysterious. He doesn't want to be, remain unknown to you. In fact, the whole story of the Bible is a God who is introducing himself bit by bit to his people. 
it began with him introducing his name. That was a really big part of the Old Testament idea of covenant was an exchanging of names. And so when God gave us his name, that was a really big deal. So it's been this, this history, this arc of introduction of God to us. And we are discovering more and more about his character and who he is. He wants to be known by us, by his people. Another great analogy is like, is like a marriage, that as you are, are married, you get to know your spouse more and more and more and more. And the moment that you are betrothed to your beloved is not like somehow the culmination of knowing everything about them. But the beauty of marriage is that you get to do so in such intimacy with another person, and you just learn more and more and more about them by being really close and really intimate with them. It's the same kind of idea with the Lord. You just you get closer, you get more intimate, you just are, 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 are developing more of a, of a relationship with him. So the things of God, he doesn't want them to remain mysterious. But if you only approach it from a natural perspective or your natural mind, you try to figure it out on your own, it will remain mysterious to you because it won't make any sense whatsoever. But the only reason why it doesn't make sense is because you're missing key logical points of origin that you begin your arguments with. Like number one, for instance, God is love. If you don't accept that as a point of origin, a lot of the Bible will be very confusing to you. Or in order to be great, you must be like the least of these. If you don't start there, then serving in children's ministries or coming early to you know, set up the coffee ministry or something, none of that really makes any sense unless you have as a point of origin for your logical thinking points of truth of the kingdom of God. I completely reject the idea that in order to be a Christian, you have to suspend your brain activity and become like a floppy, like amoebic robot for Jesus. Like, yeah, I just, you know, don't think at all. I don't think at all. That's not how it works at all. So what Paul is saying here is he's like, look, I know it seems crazy, but I am of sound mind, actually, and I'm taking pains to explain these things to you so that you will understand the reason and the heart behind why we would do something as nutty as die to ourselves so that somebody else can live. Are, are you understanding me? Again, there's this tension. We see a lot of parallelism in, in Paul. He's like, you know, on this on the one hand, blah, blah, and then on the other hand over here, and then compare and contrast. So he's saying it might look crazy, but just because it is crazy doesn't mean I can't explain it to you. And I would really warn us away from believing that faith is just having like a tingling feeling in your big toe, and then that's how I knew I was supposed to move to Denver. That, that's not how it works, actually. That's not how it works. And so we need to be careful that we don't fall on either side of the spectrum. On the one hand, only using natural analysis that will always lead you to conclusions like, like don't be uncomfortable, ever. Just don't do that. Why would you do that? I don't know. And on the other hand, being so untethered from sound mind explanation of what faith really looks like that you can't even point to a scripture that explains what you are saying you are discerning in your heart. There's a beautiful middle where we reside, where the things that we get to take part in are scary and they seem crazy and you would never do them unless God asked you to do it. But then on the other hand, we can explain it. We can explain it. So I guess the reason why I'm belaboring this so much is because something that I feel like has been a theme for our church that I'm going to articulate now. I don't think I've ever articulated this before. Um, maybe I have. <laughs> I wanted socks. I'm getting old. I can't remember things. <laughs> I feel like the Lord is, is let, me, let me say it a different way. You see what I just did there? I said, I feel like, bup, 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 bup. even that, it's too, it's too hard for people to grab a hold of. What God has shown me is that there is like a battle raging in our church. On the one hand, between true, genuine, authentic faith, and on the other hand, flesh and fear. Flesh and fear have been masquerading themselves as authentic faith. But it has duped us. It has led us astray. And what I hope to partner with the Lord to do 
is to describe and explain what living a life of faith truly looks like. And this is a great scripture to, to start with in that it warns us from going to either extreme. Being so loosey goosey that it's like, I'm gonna like paint my whole body red, you know, in faith. Like, what? <laughs> That's so weird. That is so weird. It's exceedingly weird. Um, but then on the other hand, not being willing to do anything that's crazy because, well, I can't figure it out. Both of those things are robbery in the kingdom of God, where he has for us a life of faith. This frustrates <laughs> the living daylights out of you know, so-called intellectual people. I met this one guy at Caltech where I went to grad school, and um, really great guy, funny guy. We, we hit it off, we're joking, you know, had, just getting to know each other. And, um, and then creation came up. Oh, creation. Mm-hmm. And he just could not believe that I believed creation. He just could not wrap his head around it. He thought I was, like, pulling a practical joke on him for, like, days. He was like, you don't believe that. You don't believe that. I'm like, <laughs> hello, slightly disrespectful. Yes, I do believe that. Please don't tell me what I believe or don't believe. <laughs> I'm telling you, I believe it. He thought I was joking. And then he said something to me, which is, I take as a compliment. He was like, but you seem so intelligent. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I apply myself. I read my books. I take my tests. But what he was saying was, you seem so intelligent, so I don't understand how you could believe something that is so absurd, like creation. But the thing for him that was the most like, wait, what? Was because he had been introduced to a part of my life that he, he like could connect with, he could accept. He was like, yeah, this guy's, you know, we're, we, we connect on a lot of levels, that's really great. And then he discovered that I have this, this whole belief system that he didn't know what to do with. You see, because when people encounter folks who believe something that seems crazy to them because they're only using their natural mind, they basically just automatically assume that everything else in your life has the same sort of like level of crazy, like who knows what you're going to do. And like, obviously, there's no logic to your entire life because you believe in creation. And so do you see that tension that Paul is saying here? He's like, look, we are doing crazy things because God told us to do them. That's so key. Did God really tell you to do that, and how do you know? We do crazy things because God told us to do them, but I can explain it to you if you ask me about them. I want to urge you, folks, to apply yourself to the scriptures. I challenge you to understand why you are doing the things that God has asked you to do. Why does it work for you to serve children What is it about that that's so powerful? Find out. It's in here. God wants to be known. He wants his ways to be known. But if you don't seek them, turns out, harder to find them. Seek the Lord and you will find them. this This will refine how you live by faith and not by sight. It will help you have a taste for the things that are eternal instead of having only a taste for the things that are temporal. And you'll begin to just like, it just doesn't taste good. I just, I just don't have a desire to do it anymore. I don't have a desire to go down those paths anymore because I know it doesn't have any value in the kingdom of God. So I just don't care as much about those things. It ends up guiding you in, in even more of a passive way than, than necessarily an explicit or, or active way but you will become more attuned to the things of the kingdom as you seek to understand and have your own sound mind be applied to the scriptures and understand why. And don't you dare buy into the, the, the lie that you are not smart enough, you're not accomplished enough, you're not old enough, you haven't been following God enough to understand them. God said it is simple enough for a child. And I'm looking at a bunch of adults here for the most part. You can understand them. You can get people to help you. You can have questions, engage in those questions. Don't be afraid of what you don't understand. But don't stop because you don't understand it. Seek, push through, persevere, die to your pride, ask a question. 
be of sound mind, have a ready answer for someone if they're like, why are you doing that? Be ready. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for all that you have given us. You've given us a spirit by which we can walk in faith. Lord, you've also given us a mind by which we can think, by which we can analyze. And I pray that you would help us marry those two things and that our lives would be in, in harmony in that way, that every single part of our being would be in synchronization to the song that you want us to sing, that our lives would fulfill the great purpose that you have designed us to have, and that we would learn how to bring sometimes what seems to be these two separate ideas of using my heart, using my spirit, and using my mind, using my intellect, and how to marry these two things all in submission to you, your plans, and your purposes. Lord, I pray for these here this morning that you would help them in this. Number one, God, I pray that you would alert them to things that you are asking them to do that seem really scary and they just seem crazy. But because you are asking them to do it, that they would say yes. Lord, confirm it by your word. Confirm it by the presence of counselors. Let every fact be confirmed by two or three witnesses in their lives that they would know that they know that you have spoken and you have asked them to do this thing that they would never do unless you had asked them to do it. But number two, Lord, I pray that you would give them understanding as well. Give them biblical principles, spiritual principles of understanding so that they know why or how or what, what is the principle behind what you are asking them to do. And last, God, I pray for opportunity for them to explain to others, this is why I'm doing these things. Give them opportunity, Lord. I, I, I pray that those who are seeking in our county, those, those who are in our church, those who are in our, our homes, our area, who are seeking to find you, might find a part of you in us that would lead them just further to you, Lord God. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Happy New Year. God bless you guys. Remember, prayer and prophecy next Saturday from 4 to 6. Otherwise, we'll see you next weekend. Bye-bye.